So when we first opened, I'm going to start uh, just talking about the customer experience and our customer service. When we first opened, you know, we did, um, we, we started with, you know, one of the textbook, uh, you know, check the box kind of things that you'd want to have uh, to make sure that you're offering good customer service, which is having a customer service training for staff. Um, and uh, we put that in and that, you know, that certainly has been a piece uh, to providing good service. Um, but I think one of the things that I've learned over the years uh, in terms of making uh, that experience to customers really meaningful and authentic is that myself and, and all of us at the store really have to live that day to day in the way we uh, work with and interact with the staff at the store. So it's going to, if, if I, if, our staff don't see me living the same values that we have towards treating customers towards them, they're not going to have um, the, that, that idea of, of providing great service is just going to fall flat. Um, and just to give you a little bit more of an example of that, you know, some of you may have heard um, the 10-4 rule that Zingerman's uh, uses, which says, you know, if, uh, if a customer is in within 10 feet, acknowledge them, and if they're in four feet, you know, greet them. And that's sort of the model that I use. I don't, um, you know, I don't have the opportunity to interact with customers as much as our staff do, where my opportunity a lot of times is really interacting with our staff on a day-to-day -day basis. I get, I get lots of opportunities of that. And I really use that model of 10-4 every day as I'm going through the store and, and working amongst and with our staff. And um, I think they really get to see that this is something that needs to be systemic through our entire organization. Not, we can't just have this idea that this 10-4 rule just applies to customers and nobody else. It really applies to just, and, and has to be a part of the way we are, the way we greet each other, the way we interact with each other, um, the way we, we live being a really uh, warm, friendly, and inviting place for everyone. Um, the second area that I just uh, want to talk about is pricing. And um, as uh, many of you are aware, uh, our, the pricing that um, in the, in, under, with the new normal and just the competitiveness in the landscape that we're in now, um, there's been a lot of um, challenges that we've all had to face and, and all, a lot of the products that we carry at our store have become more widely available. And um, we do pricing audits and comparisons. I'll share a little bit more about that in a minute. But, you know, even in, since the store, since the time our store is open, I've noticed that then when we do our pricing audits, the number of items that we carry and our competitors carry, um, those numbers keep going up, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, of sharing similar product lines. And we surveyed our customers to find out what the barriers were to um, them doing more of their shopping at the store. We were genuinely disappointed. We, you know, built this great store. We put all these great products in it, and we had all these all the shiny new equipment, and um, you know, four to six months into it, uh, they really weren't showing up like we had hoped they were, and um, so we need we set out to ask them to try to understand what why it was that um, they weren't shopping at the store as as we hoped we were, and over overwhelmingly, what we heard from them is that our prices were too high, um, and we really took that to heart and. Um, we immediately went out and reduced hundreds, literally hundreds of product of prices of items in our store. Uh, we reported back to them and thanked them for their input on prices and let them know of the action we took. Uh, since then, we followed up with additional uh, surveys, um, and the input that we are getting back uh, has actually remained pretty stable despite all the progress that we've made. The single biggest barrier we hear from our shoppers in terms of doing more of their shopping at the store uh, remains to be uh, is lowered prices. And um, so with that uh, subsequent feedback, we've gone out and done additional pricing analysis and we've continued to reduce. We've gone through these periods where we've um, reduced uh, 
you know, many, many uh, items in terms of their, their prices uh, within the store. And some, I know um, um, there, we also have a healthy food for all program where we give discounts uh, to people um, who qualify um, and who are in low income. But, and I think those programs are really important. And I was joking to one of our board members earlier this morning about, um, about that program um, that we have in that um, I was sort of joking that I don't care about it. But, but really what I meant was I really care about making sure that our prices are accessible to the 100% of the people who are coming into the store. You know, sure, it's great that we offer a discount to the 10% of people, but um, the co-op's going to be most successful if everyone sees the prices um, um, to be accessible. And if the customer is the heart of the co-op, sometimes I don't always feel, in, including our co-op, that we just don't do enough to make our prices accessible. I know for many of us who are in the general manager position, we feel conflicted on whether to focus on lowering our prices or increasing the wages for our staff. Uh, for us, I would say that lower, lowering our prices, as we've done repeatedly, has attracted more customers, which in turn has helped the store grow and led to improved wages for our staff. The final area I just want to uh, speak briefly about uh, in, in terms of being a, a big part of our success is uh, community involvement. And um, uh, having a focus on, on the community has been certainly a huge and important thing of what we've done. done. And um, I've really come to realize the opportunity that co-ops have as retailers uh, with, we, we, ha we have boots on the ground to uh, people who can do this work. Uh, of, of really um, connecting with the community in ways that other retailers in our area just simply don't have. They just, their, model, their models don't provide resources to work with community organizations and really uh, pioneer and show leadership in new initiatives within our community. This even, this, that, that idea even um, resonated even more strongly to me recently when we were interviewing a candidate uh, for um, a, a store manager position in our store. And the candidate uh, who worked in a conventional competitor of ours shared with me the, the process in which a, uh, a local vendor needs to go through in order to get their products into this uh, retailer. And the process, what I realized was just because the process is so cumbersome and, and, um, and, um, and because they don't have any real resources dedicated to this, oftentimes uh, it can take up to a couple years for a local vendor to be, be considered uh, to be added uh, to uh, that local store's um, product selection, mostly because of the way they the, um, they have these category groups and they only meet every X number of months and they only review X category every year. So the, the lead time in, 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 uh, in, in doing that is, is really long. Whereas, you know, you know we, can, we can bring a product, a new, a new product in um, next week or tomorrow, for example. But, but tying back to the community piece a little bit more, um, one of what I hear from our community often, uh, which is really gratifying, is that uh, comments like, you guys are so involved in the community, you do so much to support us. Um, and we, we do really live it, and I want to share just a few examples. Uh, when we arrived to the scene in 2013, we recognized that the Community Earth Day uh, Festival was, was really floundering and desperately in need of help. Um, it was uh, uh, volunteered by, um, it was organized by volunteers of a local college, uh, not this one. And the organizers naturally changed each year. And um, so we, we volunteered to take over organizing it. And since then, we've turned it into a huge community event, drawing hundreds of people. Um, and the co-op ends up being the center of the, the event itself. We, um, we invite vendors and other folks um, 
to set up um, right, uh, there's a bike path, a uh, community bike path that runs right behind the store. And we've developed this event right around the store. It really has, um, has put the co-op in the center of what's a really important event for, um, for our community. Another example, a couple, a couple years later, uh, was related to the GMO issue, and we realized how um, our co-op needed to take a more leadership role in that. And we invited uh, Gary Hirschberg down uh, to speak, um, and we, uh, rent, we took sort of a leap of faith, and we rented the theater in town that holds over 600 people. And um, we completely filled that uh, theater uh, for that event, uh, bringing in um, you know, over 600 people attending uh, to learn about and think about ways that they can get more involved um, uh, in, that, in that event. Um, later, uh, we worked on a, a new initiative uh, to bring uh, uh, community solar to our community. And um, there, was a, there's, there was a new initiative uh, two years ago uh, and we were asked to be a pilot for, for that initiative, and naturally we just jumped on the opportunity. And it ended up being a great fit for us. We worked with a couple organizers who were hope, developing a model just to put more solar on the roofs of all of the buildings in Keene, and do so using uh, lo uh, local investors and local installers. This put our co-op in the forefront of a really important initiative. Um, and two years later, we're still getting recognized for our work. If any of you do happen to see the Keene Sentinel today, um, the primary paper in town, you'll see a, me, a picture of me with the solar panels behind me on the cover of the, of the, the uh, paper. And uh, so that's been a, just another example of ways in which we've um, gotten involved with um, and participated in these important community initiatives. Um, at the staff level, we, we actively participate in, in a United Way fundraiser, and we really um, look for ways to motivate staff to get involved and participate uh, because we just know how important it is to, to fundraise for that each year. And we've uh, because of the involvement of our staff, we've uh, been recognized two different times by the United Way for the work that we do. Um, and this year, it was reported to us that our co-op had the highest participation level of staff of all the participating businesses um, in the, the fundraising campaign. Collectively, we contribute to over 93 different, um, we contributed to 93 different organizations last year, and again, that's just sort of an example of like other, other retailers in, in our area just do not have the resources to, to do that kind of work. And it's really important. It really puts us in the center of, of the community. Looking ahead, um, I see another opportunity for our co-ops to take a leadership and, uh, and, and an important initiative. And um, that's around plastic. And uh, I know, you know, we've been seeing that issue bubble up in our co-op. I've been hearing it bubble up in co-ops uh, throughout the region. Uh, you know, I was asking Mark about it even here today. You know, we're um, faced with uh, the use of plastics here with the event. And um, so I just want to leave you with that thought that, uh, you know, I shared with you some ideas of how co-ops have really pioneered, or our co-op and other co-ops have pioneered some really important initiatives and uh, want to challenge us to uh, take leadership next on the issue around plastics and how it's really impacting our, our world. So thank you. <laughs>